Hey, welcome to the Keystone Experience. Rob Work and Matt Pitzer. Brought to you by Creek Archery. Find your passion and hunt it down. And Hillview Motors, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram. Remember, Hillview has it in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. What's going on, everybody? We got a special guest with us tonight, Mr. Travis T Bone Turner from Bone Collector and Real Tree Outdoors. How are you tonight, hey. Travis? How are y'all doing? Good, buddy. Good. So, what's new down there in Georgia? Oh, we're I, just fighting this pollen, man. I, if you're familiar, if you've ever been down this way this time of year, we just wrapped up the Masters last week and. Lord gosh, the the yellow pollen that's from the pine trees is just a thick coat of mustard sauce all over everything. It's rough, boy. But, uh, a, I woke up this morning, my eyes were glued shut and nose was running, so it's starting up here in PA too. So, yep, you guys seem to run a few weeks behind us, but uh, yeah, all's good, man. I, every, everything's good down here. Just uh, hearing a few turkeys gobble. Um, I'm kind of limited at what I can do, but I've been getting out and doing some fishing and riding a four wheeler, doing a little shed hunting and stuff like that. Cause I, I, I've, I've, uh, just about went stir crazy staying in the house so much. So I'm ready to get out for sure. Yeah. I saw that on Facebook the other day. Was you catching them shell crackers on slim gyms? I swear. I promise. I've been doing that for years and usually every, every year during the spring, I'll post a couple pictures, but people don't believe it. But if you think about it, fishing for, you know, brim and, uh, and, 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 uh shell crackers like that for them it it's meaty it's got a you know it's definitely got a little zing to it if they bite it you know they're tasting it but it's so tough you can catch like three and four brim on one little old quarter inch and you don't have to dig around in the worms you don't have to worry about going to get cricket bait and if you don't catch anything well you got a nice slim jim to eat on the way home <laughs> <laughs> now, how did you find that trick out to using slim jims well, everybody down this way for everybody's uh, for fishing for catfish, they've used hot dogs for years. I don't know if you guys you ever heard of that. Yeah. And I just thought, man, there's so many beef sticks, and you know, we as hunters were always eating on meat sticks or beef jerky, and I thought, man, a slim jim's got that tough rind on it because every time you try to hook a hot dog, it's real soft. It ain't got that you know like casing like a bratwurst or whatever. And I thought a slim jim small, it's easy to, I mean, like. One stick will last you all day long. Seriously, you can catch so many fish off one stick of Slim Jim, and you just you just hook a little bit on piece on there, and it just is tough as leather. They can't rip it off, so you know, they're constantly trying to work at it like a little piranha. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to use Slim Jims now. Yeah, we yeah. Go yeah. We're going to have to see if trout like it. I'm not, and I'm not, a red wiggler is hard to beat. I mean, like if you just want a sure thing. I mean, I'm not telling people not to go buy bait because a red wiggler is you know always good but but for my you know if we're, we're going to go down there and try to catch some panfish it, you can't beat a slim jim i mean it's like you could you know if i was on one of them survival shows i think if i i could pick me a a meps or a rooster tail spinner and a, a slim jim with a number six hook and I, I think i could catch every fish on every island there ever was i, I mean <laughs> everything eats him <laughs> So what got you started in the outdoor industry? Um, well, like, uh, like so many, uh, I mean, everybody, our, our dads, our uncles, our, you know, neighborhood friends and stuff like that. We, 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 my dad was a hunting fisherman. And so ever since I could, you know, go fishing or hunting, I was always doing something outdoors and I just loved it. And, you know, different from the, the kids of today, I always got to, uh, you know, go, we, we just found things to do outside. Mom would have to yell after dark to get us to come in. We all know how that is. So I, you know, going through high school, I'm like, man, what am I going to do for a living? Cause I didn't make the best grades in high school. And, uh, you know, um, I, I was like, man, I got to do something. And you're trying to figure out which path you want to go. And, you know, our generation's always talking about, you better go, you know, you need to go to college. You need to go to college. Well, I wasn't making good grades in high school. I mean, college wasn't for me. So, I got a job working for Mercedes Benz um, when I was in high school and I just continued doing that. I was making pretty good money and I was doing interior work and a lot of the warranty service work for Mercedes Benz. So 
I just kept on doing that. And then, but, but still, you know, to ask a kid that's 19, 20, 21, 22 years old, you know, like, here's a gun to your head. You better decide what you're going to do for the rest of your life. I, that's a, that's a pretty hard decision to make because you ain't even experienced the world yet, but you know, hindsight's 2020. Now that I'm, you know, 50 years old, I can look back and say, yeah, this is, this is the way to do it. And this is the way we try to relay to the, the youth of today. But I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I said, well, I don't want to do this Mercedes Benz stuff. Cause I was driving to downtown Atlanta and getting stuck in traffic. And, and you know, it's a, it's only 32 miles, but yet it was taking me an hour and 15 minutes to get home and to work every day. I'm like, I can't do this every day. So I, um, I said, I'm going to go to HVAC. Uh, you know, I was going to be a heat and air technician. So I went, did night school and took some classes while I was still working at Mercedes Benz. So for two years, I went to school for it thinking that's job security. You get to work outside. It ain't the same thing every day. You're not going to the same place. I said, that'll be a great, a, a great skill, a trade to, to learn. And uh, about the time I was graduating or getting done, I'm like, man, I do not want to do this for a living. I mean, it took me two years. I was like, I do not want to be a. Yeah. I a can tell you that from experience. I did that for 15 years. Yeah. So, I mean, nothing against that, but I was just like, I do not want to do this. Well, my dad and my uncle had always told me, you know, and you, you kind of blow it in one ear and out the other. They said, if you'll pursue your passion, you'll never feel like you worked a day in your life ever. And I thought, man, I'm, while I'm young, I'm in early in my early twenties, I started co competition archery. I'd started that when I was 19. Um, I, before I even killed a deer with a bow, I started shooting tournaments and I, I just fell in love with archery. I mean, I love fishing. I, I, you know, I thought I was going to be a professional fisherman when I was in high school and middle school, but I love fishing so much, but anything having to do with hunting and fishing and then archery came along. And then I thought, man, while I'm young and don't have any responsibilities, meaning like I didn't have kids, I didn't have a wife, I didn't have a mortgage. I was still living at home. I said, I'm going to try this. If I fall flat on my face, I can always go back to HVAC or I can always go back to working for Mercedes Benz. But while I'm young, because, you know, once you get those responsibilities, it's hard to hard to quit a regular paycheck because you're providing for your family and stuff. So I'm like, I, you know, I can eat Raymond noodles and I can eat, uh, um, you know, potted meat and crackers and, <laughs> and beans and sausages. I can, I can survive. I'll, I'll do it, but I'm going to pursue my passion. So I took a job working in an archery shop, took about a $10,000 a year pay cut, but I was working closer to my home. I wasn't having to deal with traffic. I was going to the next town over. I was working in the archery uh, shop and man, like from day one, I mean, I, I was working more hours, but I was doing, I was preparing people's bows, preparing their arrows. You know, I thought, man, this is it. This is it. I was loving it. Could not wait to get to work, working 50, 60 hours a week. Didn't feel like I was working at all. No burden. No. And I thought, man, this is it. Even if, even if I don't make a lot of money, I'm happy. There's a lot to be said for loving going to work every day and enjoying your job. I did that for two, two years. And then I, uh, me and a buddy of mine decided to open our own store and all the best hunting and fishing is about an hour, hour and a half South of Atlanta. So I, uh, moved, he had a, he had a little track of land and had a couple of horses on there. I bought a mobile home for $19,000, parked it on his, got it all set up in his horse pasture. And, uh, we opened up a store down this way, which happened to be only 45 minutes from Realtree headquarters. So I'm here. I am thinking I'm, I'm a tournament archer. I was lucky enough, fortunate enough. I won the world championships in 1991. I'm working on people's bows. We opened our store. Now the store granted, don't get me wrong, a new store, a new business or anything. I mean, there were some definitely humble times. Uh, you know, I can remember, you know, going a whole week and the cash register only ringing like 150 bucks. I'm like, man, I don't know how long we can keep this up, but you know, there was lean and mean times and I didn't have a family or anything like that. I'd moved down there. I was living, I, I was kind of happy. It's just me and my dog living in a trailer and I had the archery shop and then I was shooting tournaments, you know, on the weekends and traveling all across the country. And thank goodness I had the, the, the money I was making from shooting tournaments and winning a few tournaments to help subsidize the store, not doing so good. And then, you know, after a couple of years, the score, the store caught traction, started doing real good. All the guys from Realtree started coming to our store. I was facilitating them, all the country music singers and the celebrities that was hunting with, with Realtree. I was helped setting up their bow. And then, you know, just slowly but surely, the, the, the business grew and it 
and it grew real, real good. And I got became good friends with Michael and Nick, you know, through Realtree. They worked at Realtree and was Nick was a camera guy. Realtree was, I mean, uh, Michael was naturally he was a camera guy and then actually started doing some hosting. So I, uh, I was real fortunate to, to, to be working with Realtree and still shooting tournaments. And um, then, then I started, uh, they asked me to be a part of the real, you know, I, I don't know if you guys have seen the monster bucks DVD Mm -hmm. and the VHS series, you know, with Jeff Foxworthy, the incomplete hunter, it goes way back to like 1999, 2000. They asked me to be a sidekick with, with uh, Jeff Foxworthy, which is where I got my name T-Bone and started doing more and more stuff with Realtree and, uh, and was a, you know, a, a guest appearances on Realtree out, uh, Realtree road trips when Michael started that in 2003. And then a guy approached me about buying my store after 12 years of business. I sold my store in 2006, still worked for that guy. I had to transition people, the clientele over to him. I kept the real estate. He just wanted the business because I kind of had everything sewed up in our area. And then, you know, at the end of my two years of having, having to work, I mean, I worked longer than that, but I had to work for the guy for two years, uh, bring stuff into his store. I was excused to do stuff with Realtree. It, it was a, really just so blessed that everything lined up and then of course we started bone collector in 2008 so been doing stuff with uh you know for oh lose them Travis, you still there, buddy? I don't know what happened there. I think it was my, my, uh, I don't have, I, I mean, I got great Wi Fi here, but I think it crapped itself. It went out for a little bit. It never happens, but by gosh, it did right in the middle of a podcast. Didn't it? <laughs> yeah, spe- especially with guys learning Zoom for the first time. I'm sitting over here going, What'd you do, Rob? <laughs> yeah. I don't know when it, when it quit on uh, you, what you got to or whatever, but. I don't remember at this point. I was too busy panicking, worrying that I screwed something up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was just talking about, I, I got to the point, I guess, where, um, you know, we started Bone Collector. We've been doing that yeah. for 14 years or whatever. So. Yeah. Right around know. there. Yeah. That sounds like a great place to pick it up to me. You know. Okay. Well, actually, yeah, just, let, let me ask you this real quick before we jump into that. Um, yeah. And I think you've kind of explained it a little bit, but how was that transition from, shooting tournaments on the weekend into television. Did you go full-time into television or did you still do some weekend stuff as well in in shooting tournaments? Yeah. Um, I, I shot perfect. I mean, professionally or shot tournaments regularly from like 1988 all the way to about 2002. And it was just a transition meaning like there's not one of those things that you're going to just absolutely can stop one or the other. It's just, uh, I was fortunate enough as many tournaments as I was shooting and, uh, you know, having endorsements and partnerships with companies, it was enough to, you know, help subsidize the income a little bit from the store. So, uh, starting filming, I mean, I just transitioned into television. It wasn't just like a quick cold Turkey. It was just like, Hey, well, you know, I'm a guest here and, you know, you get little doors open and you get opportunities. And then this company says, Hey man, you did good on that. We'd like for you to do you know, archery clinics, we'd like for you to do grand openings at stores and, you know, you know, just little things open and it transitions over. Well, uh, you know, doing tournaments, I stopped traveling so much because one, the tournament money for the tournaments had changed a lot. We used to get paid a lot more money than even like Levi Morgan and them do now. Like shooter of the year was getting $50,000 back in 1995, 1996. Whereas now, you know, the guy who wins shooter of the year or, the world championships is only getting a check for like 2,500 bucks, which, which is still good, but nothing like, cause we had ESPN covering it and we had uh, non-endemic sponsors and stuff throughout the mid mid nineties. So it was a lot more lucrative in the mid nineties than even it is to now. Um, the way the guys are doing it now is, but from uh, contingency monies from companies, you know, if a Levi Morgan wins, he gets a big, Happy Gilmore check from Matthews for ten thousand or fifteen thousand dollars. So, you know that that's the incentive to do so. 
So, I, you know, I just made the decision that I'm traveling, being away from my family. You know, by now I got a family and, you know, wife and a son. And I, I said, man, I got to do something that is a little more uh, solid income and something I can depend on. You know, I don't mind working hard and doing extra things. But, you know, this going to a tournament saying, gosh, I sure hope I win because, man, that water bill's due. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> that, ain't, that ain't no pressure you need when you're shooting a tournament. So, I, I you know, I made the the adult decision to try to try to do, do something. And fortunately I had uh, opened a lot of doors and made a lot of connections through Realtree. And, uh, you know, I, I guess you guys can already see, I got a kind of a gift to gab. I'll talk the horns off a of billy goat. So <laughs> <laughs> with all that said, I kind of transitioned into, you know, uh, doing seminars, clinics, working for Realtree and, you know, getting to guest appear on their shows. And then me, Michael and Nick, hit it off so well we started bone collector in 2008 and i'm thinking here i am i've sold my business um you know i really don't know what the next chapter of my life is other than hey i'm doing a few things with real tree and now we're going to start this tv show bone collector and i'm thinking man is this going to work or not you know i'm like well we'll figure out something somebody will hire me to fletch some errors you know if this thing falls but we'll try it but we're so fortunate that, you know, it was a different type of TV show and, and we hope that people watching our show likes watching the show from the sense, the standpoint of, man, I'd like to go hunting with those guys. It just seems like a good time rather than like, we're glad our show doesn't hinge on you got to kill a 180 inch buck every week because, you know, there's way more to it. We all want to kill a 180 inch buck, but fact of the matter is, is, I get excited when an old slick head walks out there and it's time to, you know, put some meat in the freezer. That, that kind of, so we hope our show showed that the camaraderie, the fellowship between me, Michael and Nick, the cutting up, we want people to think like, man, my hunting camp's like that. My hunting buddies are like that, or I'd like to go hunting with them or, you know, and then the cherry on top is we, we kill a decent buck or a, a mature buck wherever we're at. And, you know, that that's, that's not the whole meat and potatoes of the show. And it seems like it's worked pretty good. You know, we've been, pretty successful thanks to all the people that have liked the show and uh you know we're we're still one of the top tier shows on outdoor channel and we're uh number one on the my outdoor tv app which is rerunning all the stuff way the, all the way back to the beginning of uh, bone collector and real tree road trips you can watch all that stuff on my outdoor tv so um you know golly we're just so super blessed and you know we're going to keep doing this you know as, as long as uh as long as it's feasible to do so now, what was that conversation like all those years ago? Like, hey, let's uh, let's just start our own TV show. Well, Michael, the the way that went down is Michael's so generous and 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 always has been. He worked for we worked at Realtree, and there was so many opportunities coming. But because he was an employee at Realtree, he had to adhere to their. You know, me and Nick have never been an employee of Realtree. We've always been like a a, a, a contracted laborer, so to speak. You know, we're just a, a partner with him, which is which is fine, but you know, they don't have to bear the burden of, you know, keeping us as an employee. They just, we're just a paid a hired hand when they need us. Yeah. And that means we got our, our, uh, wings are free to do what we want to on the outside and we can, you know, subsidize our income by doing other things as well. Whereas Michael had to adhere by the the company code and stuff because he was an employee. So he actually quit, quit Realtree, on good terms, you know, still hosted Realtree Road Trips, but they switched it from being an employee to like, we're just going to pay you uh, as a contracted laborer to host the Realtree Road Trips. And then Michael also started hosting a show for Gander Mountain for um, uh, for a couple of years. And in doing so, he said, you know what, I think we, you know, with, I think I want to start a show and I want to, I can't really do it by myself because I'm hosting road trips. You guys are helping with road trips as well. So let's start the show Bone Collector. I want to start a brand, you know. And the reason it started like that, the name Bone Collector is how we come up with the name. He um, he asked me and Nick, and it was perfect timing for me because I had left that the store. The store actually shut down, not because it was doing bad, but, but because the guy who bought my business out owned a financial ed, ed investment company. It was around 2008, you know, when the market crashed. And uh, he got caught... Uh, doing Ponzi schemes. He was actually, you know, right, you know, taking the money and in, investing. Anyway, he, he, he ended up all of his clients and stuff. He had about $23 million that he had stolen from his clients. So the store was doing good, but in, in doing so the FBI 
sucked everything under. So fortunately for me, I felt bad because it was a huge store and it had like uh, 19 employees. And I felt bad because everybody lost their job. The FBI came into the store and, you know, I didn't know this was going down. They said, hey, you guys got uh, three hours to get all your personal belongings out of here. We're shutting it down. And that's the last time we was in there. We had no idea. The guy got caught. He's still in prison. To this day, he's still in prison. Wow. That, yeah, that was in 2008. So uh, anyway, perfect timing for me. I was unemployed for about two or three months. We started up Bone Collector. We'd already been talking about doing the uh, Bone Collector TV show, but to get back on track of how we came up with the name for Bone Collector, Michael was uh, visiting Thompson Center uh, back in the day, and they wanted to do a Michael Waddell signature series muzzle loader. So he went up there, and they were showing him all the different models and letting him shoot them. And, uh, you, you know, he had the, had the Omega, the, the Contender, and then, of course, the Triumph. Well, the Triumph, he shot the Triumph, and, you know, he liked it because the price point was there. But he said, you know what? I don't really want a signal. I don't want it with my name on it. I'd really have a brand or something like that. So, you know, we're always, you know, all rednecks are kind of famous for one liners. He shoots that triumph and he says, man, I don't know about the rest of these, but this one right here is going to be a bone collector, you know, talking about the, telling those guys and on the plane coming back when he landed, I remember, I remember it just like it was yesterday. He landed, called, called me and Nick and said, guys, I've just been at Thompson center. And I and uh, I, I got the name of our show. We ain't even filmed anything yet. I mean, we're just still, you know, dipping our toes in the water. Like, oh my God, we got to buy cameras. Oh my God, we got to hire guys to edit this. You know, our, we included some of our friends that worked at RealTree that had left, and they're they were producers now. So we like, man, I don't I don't know how this is gonna work, but we're gonna give it we're gonna give it hell and see. Hopefully, it works good. So. <laughs> He said, he said the name of the show Bone Collector and asked me and Nick if we wanted to host it. And it took me about two seconds to say, yeah, let's, let's give it, let's give it a whirl. So we had had, um, the first thing I thought of is when he said Bone Collector, I thought that that's already been taken. Denzel Washington has that movie. I'm, I'm sure you guys have heard of them, that, yeah. the movie Bone Collector. And he said, man, I, I said, that name's already taken. I'm sure it's trademarked. There's no way we're going to be able to get that. Well, we got to looking, and I couldn't find where it was trademarked. I was doing the digging on it, and then we hired a lawyer. And uh, when we hired the lawyer, he said, no, they didn't trademark it at all. You're, you're good to go. Well, well, we was good as far as domestic goes, but then after two years in, we found out there's a knife maker in, I can't remember, Pakistan, Iraq, or something like that. He had it at, at the Bone Collector Knife Series, so we had to buy it from him. Don't hold me to it, but I want to say it was – Fifty to seventy thousand dollars, which, in the scheme of things, now is not that big a deal when you're buying a name that you've already created a large brand. But when we're just getting started back then, it was like, holy crap! <laughs> it might you as know? well have been a couple million dollars. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, golly, well, we didn't see that expense coming. So we, anyway, we 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 did it, you know, because the seemed to be going good, and we we believed in the brand, and we believed in, you know, uh, what we were doing and stuff. So that's how we came up with a bone collector the, the name bone collector is he was gonna he wanted to name that muzzle loader after it and that feels to me like that was one of the like the hunting tv shows have been around but and correct me if i'm wrong it feels like what you guys did was one of the first in the industries to to create a brand across the board yeah yeah and it was and and honestly the shows that there's so many shows out there and, you know, whether people know it or not is you have to buy your airtime. A lot of people think that you just like you're, you, you just think like, well, you're popular, you got a good show and somebody's banking on you an outdoor channel. It's kind of a reverse deal, but everything yeah. on an outdoor channel or sportsman channel or pursuit channel, you have to pay for that airtime. Whereas I'm like, this is kind of a backwards industry because like, I bet you know, the travel channel and the food network and I, they're, they're paying those people, you know, there are some shows that are hired guns, you know, like the, like if it's an original outdoor channel series, you know, they'll pay like Tom McMillan show, you know, the show McMillan, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard of that. Mm -hmm. That's a show where they just pay him to host it. They do all the creating and everything like that. And they just pay him to host it, which is, which is good. But like, we're having to buy our airtime. You, you buy your airtime for a lot. I'm not going to share oh, how yeah. much, but trust me, it's a freaking lot. It's like, Wow. And then you go out hoping to get partners and or sponsors. I, I hate to use the word sponsor because anybody that we've been with has been a long-term partner. So we're waiting. 
we're, we're looking to work with them, you know, on a long-term thing. It's not just like, Hey, will you pay our bills for one year? Yeah. It's like, no, we want this to be a marriage, you know? And, and you can see that a lot of the people that we've been with, we've been with long before we even had bone collector. So with that said, you go up, you hope to make enough money to pay for your airtime and pay for all your, your, uh, producers, filming, editing, travel expenses. And, you know, if there's any left over, then you make a little bit of money. So that with that, I say all that because, there's so many hunting shows out there. And if you don't have a brand that you're, you're using the show to promote the lifestyle and or the brand, you, you're really basically just washing, which is not a bad thing is if you love hunting that much and you got that much money to put out on the line and hopefully you get some back and you paid for all your hunting and stuff like that, which a lot of guys do that way. Or, you know, maybe some guys are stroking their ego like, Hey, I got a show. Whoa. <laughs> you know, I, you know you don't know what they're thinking, but nonetheless, if you don't have a brand to go along with it, it's, it's not a very, uh, uh, financial compensating way to go, but you're doing something you love. So there's something to be said for that. Yeah. Me and Matt was with uh, a local TV show for a while. Yeah. So we know like what the, you know, what goes yeah. on behind the scenes and all that. Yeah. And, me and him started this podcast to help keep that going through the downtime. Sure. And then we sure. took the podcast on ourselves, and, you know, we know how, trust me, it's, it's a pain in the butt getting this stuff going and getting the right partners and, yep. you know, it's hard. It, it is, but at the, you know, if we're looking at the big picture, let's everybody, you know, think about this from like a little bit about what I was saying earlier is, uh, you know, if you're pursuing your passion, yep. you know, it don't really seem like work if you're getting to, you know, we're sitting here telling hunting stories and talking to each other, you know, like, just like a campfire, a, a redneck tech campfire here. Mm -hmm. And we're having a good time and sharing it with all the, all of you guys as listeners and stuff like that. Um, you know, if you can scratch out a living doing something you love and when it's time to go to glory, it, that ain't, that ain't such a bad thing rather than pounding your head in the side of a brick wall every day, like, damn, I don't want to go to this job. <laughs> I get up every morning and do that. <laughs> yeah. What do you do for a living? I work in the oil and gas industry, which is, you know, we, all know, we all know how that's going right now. You know, It's a roller coaster, isn't it? Yeah. 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 A couple of years ago when I was doing so many Whitetails Unlimited events, man, I, I was talking to a lot of guys doing oil and gas and man, it was just absolutely rolling, but. Yep. Yeah. I can't believe you guys voted for Biden and stopped all that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I knew there was something I should have mentioned in the pre-show. <laughs> you're you're going to get him started here on something. And you're going to cause me a lot more editing work here, Travis. <laughs> well, what do you do for a living, Matt? Uh, my dad and I have a local heating uh, oil company. We deliver home heating oil. Oh, I got you. Uh, so similar industry to him, you know, it's up and down. Yeah. But right now people are not happy. Like I'm the one setting oil prices. Yeah. Yeah. I know what I, I mean, we all our farmers and stuff like that. I mean, anybody that has any agriculture, you know how much fertilizer is going to be this next oh. year. Unbelievable. If you're, if you got cows, I mean, it affects everything. Yep. Gas, gas and oil affects everything. It's such a trickle. You, you guys know, but yep. yeah. So, uh, that's what yeah, I said yeah. about planting food plots this year. I told the guy that is on my, on the lease with me, I said to him, I said, we're going to cut back on the fertilizer this year. I yeah. Said, we'll go over and see the lady at the horse farm and get some manure and do it the old fashioned way. Yeah. I mean, you hate to do it. You don't want to do it, but man, you got to, when the prices get as high as they are, you got to. Well, yep. you got to even think about the, the fuel it costs to run the tractor. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I mean, I know, I don't know what the prices are down there, but I mean, our off-road up here is four seventy five dollars a gallon. That's the same here. And, yep. and and last time I checked them, tractors aren't very fuel efficient. No, no, no. No, and I, I love them things. I mean, like, I man, I just love doing anything in my skid steer or tractor or anything like that. And yeah, you just got to, you, you just got to bite the bullet. Yeah. I'm glad we got through the politic part of, yeah. of the podcast. <laughs> yeah. here. Well, see, that's that's you got to watch some of Michael's rants 
of you thought I was bad. Oh yeah. I watched one of him the other night. Wow, well, I'll tell you what. He was fit to be tied. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, he's got a he's got a way of putting it for sure. But uh so do you still tinker around with the setting up the bows and Oh, ab- absolutely. I've got a shop in my basement. Normally I I I would do it down there. I just we're in I'm in my living room right now, but um no, I've got a shop downstairs. It's as it's as good as not I'm not going to say a shop open to the public, but nonetheless, I set up probably 40 or 50 bows a year. Um, I, I, I love it. I mean, anything to deal with building a better mouse trap, uh, you know, the archery is just so unique, you know, no, no matter how accurate you get, no matter how much you practice, you can always do a little better and I always enjoy setting up people's bows and, you know, just watching the smile on their face, you know, they're thinking, God, I'm gonna have to shoot two hours a day for six weeks, just about to hit a baseball. And then, then, you know, you take them out there and you, you get them set up correctly, the right draw length, the right poundage. And, you know, right in everything tuned, arrow selection, and you, you know, take them outside at our range here at the house and let them shoot, and they're just drilling, hitting a baseball every time at 20 yards right off the bat. And just to see that they're like, man, I'm going to be able to do this. This is awesome. <laughs> this is nothing that I expected. So, no, it, it's uh, it's great. I st- No, I, my wife said that too. She said we built our house back in 09, and she says, why are you building a shop in the basement? You sold your shop three years ago. And I'm like, as long as I live, I will always be tinkering on bows. I mean, I could be dipping septic tanks for a living, and I'm always going to be tinkering with bows. So, yeah, to answer, the long answer to your question is, yeah, absolutely. I've got a indoor range and shop and everything downstairs. Yeah, see, we when when I'm not at my normal job or doing the podcast, I work at a archery local archery shop up here. Oh, uh, cool. Crick Archery. We, we me and Matt both go down there and help out. And, yeah. That's awesome because. Uh, my my heart is with the independent retailer honestly that um you know i i on these podcasts and you know i had my own store for 12 years there's no as great as bass pro shop and cabela's is and ordering stuff online there's nothing that is going to replace the service that you get at an independent retailer to where you're custom set up you're tailor fitted and uh, the knowledge that you're going to get from guys like yourself who are going in there you know, for, for the, the beginning archer, the, all the tidbits and stuff, when people are shopping online and they're saying, well, I can get that stabilizer $3 cheaper if I order it online rather than going to my shop. I try to encourage people to go to the shop and do that because, you know, that's what keeps those shops in business. That's what keeps those shops. And man, it's a great place to, to go hang out and, and be mm-hmm. with you know, fellow, you know, like-minded fellas. So there's nothing that's going to take the place of, you know, an independent retailer. So I believe me, I fly the flag and I try to um, make sure I raise up all the independent retailers because we got to keep in the mom and pop shops or what's keeping the, the, the archery going in, in the, in this country. Yeah. Well, that's, that's funny. I do say that because that's actually how I wound up working down at Creek Archery was went down just to found them online. I needed help with something, walked in, just started hanging out, talking with this guy and, and the owner and a couple other people down there. Before I know it, I'm just down there hanging out, not even shooting yeah. my bow, just BSing, having a great time. I finally looked at uh, Chris and said, well, you know, you might as well put me to work. Instead of just sitting here on the chair taking up real estate, why don't you show me what we got to do here and I can help out? That's four or five years now. Yeah. Yeah, we've been there a while with him. Uh, so, yeah, you got to – Got to try to go to those places. We, we've got a couple around here, and um, we try our best to, like you said, fly, let everybody know those shops need you. Uh-oh. Oh, man. Did we lose them again? I think so. Travis, you still there, buddy? I'm back. <laughs> Dude, I, guys, I'm, I apologize. That's two times. That's oh, all right. I, I just, you know what? I, I, I had a little bit of time to think. I think because I mentioned uh, Biden, I think they cut us off twice. <laughs> <laughs> I just said to Matt, I said, they might be getting some weather down there. I, no, I, it's not. It's, it's, it, everything's fine. I don't know what it is, but it's, 
I, I've been on the computer doing stuff. I mean, I've worked in my office all day long, not had one drop. And then I've had two here <laughs> in this hour with you guys. I promise you. Just working that computer too hard. It's telling you yeah, time for a break. I guess the wires outside are smoking. <laughs> I mean, the wires outside better be smoking the better than that quad I saw. What was that a year or so ago you had out in the driveway? Oh my gosh. I mean, you talk about blessings. I mean, it's real easy to look at it and say, gosh, man, T Bone's four wheel burn up. But honestly, guys, 95% of the times I park it in my garage underneath my house. But we were late for a lunch meeting. So we were out working on the uh, back side of the property and, uh, I don't know if you can see in the security footage, my buddy's riding on the back. He's letting, you know, we were out in the back and I said, just jump on the forward and we'll drive up here, get in the truck and go. I'm like, we'll be back in an hour and a half from lunch. I said, I'm just going to park it here in the driveway. No need to put it underneath the, the house. It would have burnt my house up if I wouldn't have done that. Seriously. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Thank, thank goodness you didn't park it underneath there. Oh, so lucky. So lucky. <clears throat> uh, yeah. We saw that on social media. I'm like, man, I mean, it went quick. Real quick. Yeah. And if you zoom in, you can see the little flashes up underneath the front fender. So it, it's like it started in an area where there's not, you know, you would think it'd be around the engine or up underneath the gas tank, but it was in the front. I mean, it was up underneath the, looked to me like it was like weeds or something had built up underneath there and there was a little short and that stuff caught on fire and man, away she went. Now, now speaking of social media, I got to say, I follow you on all your social media. Got to have some of the funniest stuff posted on there daily. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I, I don't know. I guess it ain't your standard archery slash hunting posts and stuff. But I, I mean, I find it funny. And in this world, man, there's so many doom and gloom things to to get uh, sucked into. So I thought, man, I'll just share some of this stuff because it makes me smile and laugh and. Hopefully other folks will think that so too. And, you know, just mix it up rather than just being all partners and sponsors and archery and hunting and, you know, just, you know, it's, it's things that you see and have a smile at. So I, I like that kind of stuff. Oh, absolutely. And I got to say, uh, both me and my, my two boys, every time we get on the escalator, we call it the T-bone. Yeah. <laughs> clean, clean the boots up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I think that's kind of turned into a, redneck national phenomenon <laughs> <laughs> and, and here you thought you were probably just sharing something simple a little bit funny yeah well, yeah I, thought, to it. I mean every time i've been on an escalator since i was a kid i've always thought like what in the heck are them brushes for on the sides <laughs> i mean really i was like what is that for and then i thought man i just clean my boots when i go down through there so <laughs> i don't know i posted it like five or six years ago and it's just i i, I usually get somebody sending me one where they've done, you know, at least once a day or, or, or even more. It's like everybody gets on an escalator and uh, I guess I, I guess I'm always thought of on an escalator. <laughs> yeah. Not on a treadmill, but on an escalator. So <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, I saw you posted a thing the other day about that new 10 point. Have you shot it yet? Oh, amazing. I mean, Honestly, it's a, a lot like their Havoc, the one they had last year that was so well, but they increased the, the power stroke on it. It is – I've always been a fan of that reverse prod, you know, where the mm -hmm. limbs are out front and the prods, and it just balances so much better and it, and it shoots so much better. But it is, it is so quiet for, you know, for 505 feet per second. I haven't shot it through the meter yet. Um, I, I got to do that yet. But, uh, man, it's it, – it's unbelievable. I never would have thought we'd have a crossbow shooting 505 with a bolt or arrow that is for hunting. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you would think you could do it with something extremely ultra light, basically dry firing the crossbow. But I mean, this is legit. It's, it's, it's a, it's a pretty slick. I mean, I know they're pricey and you know, that's, it's not for everybody, but just to know that the company that you're, you're buying from is one, it's American made. And then two, that, they've got that much innovation to do that. Even if you, you know, even if it's not in your budget, it's nice to know that these are the things that we're reaching up to now. Yeah. I do a lot of the crossbow work down at the, down at Crick. So I've worked yeah. on a lot of them, the Ravens, the, the Scorpids. And yeah. When I seen you post that, I was like, man, I can't wait to get my hands on one of those when they come in the shop. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, uh, 
the guy that the Scorpids are really uh, nice. And actually, if I'm not mistaken, the the guy that owns that company or started that, he's the one that came up with the reverse prod uh, technology years ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, whether it's, I, I may be misspoken. You you may have more information about this than me, but it's like the, I almost like the, the patent had run out or it was time to share with the world because so many people, uh, you know, wasn't using the reverse prod until here the last three or four years. And you are seeing everybody's going to it now. Yep. And I, I think that's the way it, that way it went down, but those are good crossbows as well. We got that. Uh, we also got that Excalibur, that dual shot. Yeah. And I, I haven't played around with it, but. I'm going to. I heard there's a company out there that makes a trigger for that, so you could double tap it. Oh, is that right? So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know a redneck's going to pump. They're going to tap into that. <laughs> was was the ten point uh, last year the one that we sent at fifty yards through the building, two walls, and stuck into the other side? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we we pulled it out of the box. And a little bit of power behind those things. One of our yeah, customers yeah. wanted us to sight it in for him, and we took it out, and I forget what it was, 60 or 70 it, it, yards. 50 yards. And shot, and it went through the showroom wall, through the wall where the crossbows were hanging, crossed the archery range into the exterior wall on the opposite side of the building. Yeah. And we picked that arrow up and shot it again. It was perfectly fine. But poor White Joe ain't got a chance, does uh, he? No. Nope. <laughs> I thought I said as soon as it happened, you know, it goes through steel sheeting, two walls. I said, well, at least we know if we ever find an old abandoned building out in the woods somewhere and a deer's hiding behind the wall, we know we can get through it now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Check that off the redneck list. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 it's, it's amazing all the innovations that's going into those things. And, you know, the, you know, a lot of people are kind of surprised that I, you know, are, are for crossbows. They expect me with my, with my, I mean, I don't mean this to be arrogant, but like with a tournament background, it's like, man, you're the compound guy. But dude, I, I mean, if you've listened to any, you know, I've, I've preached this big time. If it's legal, I'm for it. If they hit, if they had wrist rocket season, I'd be fine with that. I mean, whatever's legal and whatever can get you in the woods and, you know, makes you happy, I'm all for it because a crossbow, you know, the way to paint a picture is like a guy was to go, wants his family to start shooting archery to get four complete compound setups. That's a pretty, that's a pretty big expense to, to incur and not even know if his family's going to like it, yep. whether with a crossbow, you can let everybody shoot it. You can let everybody try it. You can watch the flight of the arrow. Everybody gets a chance with hunting with it. And then you're, you know, you basically, uh, you know, seeing how you like archery. And then you, usually a lot of people graduate over to a compound bow anyway. That's always going to be my favorite. However, I dabble with the traditional bow. I like shooting a recurve from time to time. And and on top of that, I, you know, the crossbow is nice too. It's, golly, I mean, just because they're capable of shooting 100, 120 yards and grouping really tight, that don't mean, you know, shooting at a live animal. That's not something that you necessarily need to do because they can take a step. They can flinch or whatever, but well, it sure is nice to know you can just about knock the knocks off at 50, 60 yards with those things. They are so slick. Yep. Yeah, and I agree with that. You know, we have people that come down there completely against crossbows, and I always look at them and say, you know, we're all going to reach a point where we're not strong enough to draw a compound back. And yep. Come see me when that happens, because at that point you've got two options, quit hunting, archery, or pick up a crossbow. Yeah. I mean, you know, you, you, you shoot long enough, you're going to, you know, your shoulders are going to get wore out. Your elbow may, you know, you may trip and fall. I mean, there's a need for it. And I, I'm not going to, you know, let that stop me from getting out in the woods. So, no, yeah. It's, and, and it goes back to just why do we have to always make it a negative? We've got enough people on the outside of hunting trying to do that. Why do we need to bicker and argue over what we legally use? Exactly. Exactly. I mean, you know, you got people that shoot rifles that are like, you know, anti 6.5, you need a 300 win mag. And I'm like, what does it matter? You yeah. know what I mean? As long as it's legal, let's pat each other on the back. Let's raise each other up, you know, and, and, uh, you know, swap stories and stuff like that, share experiences. But 
you know, I mean, all we're doing is killing deer, guys. What, however you want to do it, that, that's fine with me. I mean, if they would legalize grenades, I'm fine with that too. Yep. Uh, that sure would make fishing a lot easier. Oh, man, are you kidding me? That'd be <laughs> awesome. <laughs> And the same we're talking about promoting, why is that so important to you to continue to promote hunting in a positive way? Um, for, for me, I look at it as I've been blessed enough to have this platform and you see so much bickering, like, you know, you're talking about, you see people are, you know, you're, you're nothing if you're a whitetail hunter and, you know, you need to be able to climb a mountain and shoot, you know, shoot stuff. Uh, you know, to sheep hunt or being the ultra shape. I, I want to promote hunting or I want to plant the seed with people because hunting and archery has done so much for me in my life, provided for my family. And, and with, with my platform, you know, I, I'll gladly stand up to anti hunters or people who are anti compound crossbow or whatever. And in a tactful, positive light, I want to make sure that I plant that seed that look guys, we may seem like well, there's a lot of us out there, a lot of hunters, but we're a small pea in the pod compared to all the population. We need to promote this in a positive light so that we can preserve our hunting heritage. So if, if I'm out there and I can touch a few people and put smiles on their faces and make them, you know, think positively about, I'm fortunate enough to get to hunt a lot each year, but you know, a lot of guys, blue collar workers, they're working six days a week. They're doing everything they can just to go out one afternoon or one morning on the weekend. And uh, who am I to be on a soapbox telling them they need to do it this way, they need to do it that way? At the end of the day, that guy needs to go out there and recharge his batteries because he is under a lot of stress of having to work his butt off for six days a week. So I get that. I came from that. I understand that. I mean, I go to these events, and I'm with the, the blue-collar worker and stuff, so I'm not – on my high horse is like, this is the way you have to kill a deer in a 180 inch buck. Dude, if you only get three days to hunt a year and you want to shoot you two nannies on a weekend, shoot you two slick heads and, and just be proud of it. I'm all for that. So I hope that answered your question about, you know, just, I just want to see it go on. I just want to know that in this day and age, watching my son grow up and in the last 15 years, technology has absolutely taken over and has taken away the need to be outside 20 years ago we were outside all the time like we're talking about growing up whereas now our kids they're so distracted by uh, you know you can't fight it you can't you can't change it it's inevitable that there are telephones and i mean cell phones and all the electronic technologies and all the games and distractions and stuff that they have somehow some way i want to make sure that we're planting positive seeds for people to be outside and how how you get so much more out of being outside and hunting and stuff than, than just, Oh, I killed a deer. If that makes sense. Yep. Yep. The hunting experience is 365 days a year, whether you're working on food plot, whether you're flipping through a magazine, whether you're going down to your local archery shop, shooting the bull, whether you're, you know, saving up your money to buy a new site because you want it on there. All of these things add to it, you know, and, and then the popple, the, the pimple actually pops whenever you shoot the deer yep. or, you know, that's, that's, that's just the cherry on top, but it's not just like, man, I spent eight, eight hours in the woods on Saturday, man, that sucked. No, it didn't suck. I, mm. I get in this day and age, I get so much more excited about the build up to it and the preparation than I do the actual hunt. Yep. Yeah. You, you need to find joy in all of it. Yep. I went out this year and bought my first inline muzzleloader. Yeah. And I've always hunted with flintlocks. Oh, yeah. And uh, I was one of those guys. I was always against them. Like, man, I really don't want those guys to be hunting the same time I'm hunting with my flintlock. Yeah. Well, I went and bought one, and I had a doe step out at 175 yards the last day of the flintlock season, or the muzzleloader season. Yeah. And I smoked her. And I'll tell you what, I had more fun. And I mean, I shot at a bunch of deer this year with the flintlock and missed. Yeah. You know, and I had more fun. And I'll tell you what, they were talking about it combining the two seasons here in PA. And when they have that meeting at the game commission's office, I'm going to take the day off of work and I'm going and I'm going to be 100% for combining it. Yeah. Good you for know? you. Yeah. The, the technology is incredible that they've come up with on muzzle loaders, isn't it? Oh, I bought a CVA Optima V2. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, I, 
I, I thought I was Jim Shockey for a minute. I put that gun up there on that <laughs> tripod and I settled in and, you know, I, I forgot to hit the record button on the camera, but I dropped her right in her tracks at 175 yards. I was, that's awesome. I was impressed. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. I've, uh, I've been, I, I've, I've killed quite a few deer with a muzzleloader. It's pretty, pretty nice actually. Yeah, I, I can try a flintlock or not a flintlock and in line. I don't shoot flintlocks anymore. Somebody's <laughs> ruined that one for me. Yeah, the flintlocks, uh, I've been on a couple of hunts back in the, I mean, hats off to those guys that do that, trying to keep your powder dry. And <laughs> there we had a three-day hunt on a public land that we used to always do. It's called BF Grant. It's in the center of the state in the Piedmont region. And we'd go on, I would always bow hunt, but it was a primitive weapons hunt. So you could use, most of the guys had flintlocks or muzzleloaders. This was before inlines. This was 15, 20 years ago. And uh, I'd take my bow, but man, you could just every at night, but it, the, the last one that I went on, it was real rainy, drizzly, and everybody was complaining about, you know, snapping the cap or the flint, you know, the flintlock being wet and they, they wasn't getting there, you know, no, no fires. And I guarantee them deer heard a lot of cussing throughout the woods. Like, oh, one, of, one of the biggest bucks I've ever seen in my life was the last day of flintlock season three years ago. And I had to let him walk because I pulled the trigger on that gun three times and it didn't go off. Oh my gosh. And I'm standing there thinking, you know, I, I got a perfectly good compound bow sitting at home and this buck was in 15 yards. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and I just, I mean, he was for PA, he was 145, maybe 150 inches. That's a great buck anywhere. And I just had to let him walk, you know? Yeah. Every time yeah. I pulled the trigger, you hear that click. Yep. He'd look around and he'd go right back to feeding. And I'm like, man, this never happens. Why is my gun doing this to me? Yep. <laughs> Got home yeah. and it was just a little dirt and a little oil on the frizzing. And we, we, uh, we've all been there, man. We've all, that's what makes these great stories like this. The one that got away. Yep. Next time we talk in two years, he's going to be a 160 inch buck. Oh, I, I, I tell you <laughs> what, I seen him. I don't know if it was him. It might've been one of his offspring this year during bow season, but he chased the doe around up in the field above me for 35 minutes. And I did everything I could do. I blew a grunt call till I was blue in the face, you know, and he just wanted nothing to do with me. Yeah. Golly. So that's did, what keeps me going happened? back. Yeah. Whatever happened to him? Was it on a piece of property that you frequent or did somebody kill it or? No, he isn't. I got pictures of him a month and a half ago. Okay. On our on our lease property, he was well, actually on the fr farm that borders our lease property. Like my, I got a stand set up right on the property line. Yeah. And he was in their cow pasture chasing her around. Well, then, you, you might uh, have another chance with him. Yeah, yeah, I think we'll we'll get him. That's what I like. It's like a chess game, you know. It absolutely is. You know, that's a piece of technology where we like to have now is the cell cams. Yeah. My cell cam, I'll tell you what, without that thing, I'd be lost. Honestly, hasn't that changed? That's been the number one thing in the last 15 years, in my opinion. Yeah. Now, what do you Trail think cam about some states trying to start banning those? Well, if you, you got to really deep dive into why they're banning them, like what, what, like, I'm not saying I agree with it. However, they're trying to do the best thing for, uh, uh, you know, like in, uh, I believe it's Arizona. The reason they're doing it is because guys are going up before season in the real dry, arid areas, which we don't have to contend with here in the east, you know, if you're east of the Mississippi. But they're going up and they're spending lots of times uh, up in the high al uh, high altitude and the, the mule deer and the elk and such that are used to going to watering holes they're not able to get the water that they need. So therefore the herd is suffering because there's so much human pressure up there in the time of the year that they need the water. So that that's, they should, they should maybe localize bandit or stop the use of it so that people won't go up there. But so many people are trying to get the jump on, uh, you know, where the deer is and such that they're really disrupting the, uh, the, 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 I guess the ecosystem or the, you yeah. know, the, it's not good for the herd. Meaning like if they keep it going, I understand that the possibilities, 
I'm not saying I'm for it or against it, but I'm understanding the reasons a little bit more. But if a state's just outright trying to ban it just because just because they don't want you, you know, they think it's it helps you kill the deer, I think that's ridiculous. My, my opinion is, is if you've got it figured out that there's so many, your carrying capacity of deer is a certain amount and you know that the hunters are going to take this amount and they allow you to kill this amount. I don't care if they let you use a bazooka or whatever. It, it doesn't really matter. Once you kill your limit, you kill your limit. And that's right. it. Right. Yeah. So it, it, it doesn't, you know, if you abide by the limits that, that shouldn't really matter. But if you're messing with their, you know, their existence, I can understand maybe putting a halt on that. I had that to talk limit. with one of our local game wardens here. I said to him, I said, you know, I said, by the time that thing sends me a picture, I'm at work. I get in my truck, drive to my hunting area, climb up my tree stand. That buck's already on two different farms. Oh, easily. He's not there. So that's not, it, it's letting me know that he's in the area. Exactly. And I can get a pattern on him, but that doesn't yep. mean that he's, I'm going to get harvest that deer that day no. that I see a picture of him. No, it's just nice to know what's on the property and or you know like especially what i use them for is here lately especially in georgia it, it's they're all vampires it's like you get all nighttime pictures but mm -hmm. if you back off the pressure no matter how much bait you put out no matter how much food you got if there's human pressure on them they're gonna go nocturnal period right so i use the cameras to make sure that it's low pressure so that the deer feel more comfortable and it allows me to know when to go in there. Right. Another good thing is with, with our youth, it lets them enjoy the herd all year long. It, you know, it gives them a little sweat equity. It's like, hey, we got these pictures of this deer. I know this deer's there. We've been putting out the camera rather than just going out there like we had to do 20 years ago. Yeah. Sitting there waiting. And then you see a horn step out and you have no idea what that deer is. Mm -hmm. And you end up shooting it. And it was like, oh, man, it was a three-pointer. But I thought it was an eight-pointer. Mm -hmm. So you're having to make split decisions. Whereas this way you kind of got a little sweat equity in your herd. So it, it boosts the pride factor on, you know, what you're killing and taking. I'm not saying everybody needs to be on the big trophy buck, you know, regiment that's that's to each his own, but at least, you know, like, man, you know what? I've counted 17 different does. It's going to be okay if I shoot a couple of does, or you can say like, I ain't seen many does i don't know if i'm going to shoot one this year right you know it helps you manage it so that you got you got sweat equity in the game that chess game so that it helps the pride factor rather than just like being dropped off without any intel you're just sitting there and you don't know do i shoot this buck is this the only buck i'm gonna see is there a possibility of a 140 here do i you know it's helping you answer all those questions so right. yeah I, I think it's a great tool See, it worked in our favor this year because my daughter had shot one in bow season and she put a bad shot on him. Two weeks later, I got pictures of him still alive. She ended up taking that deer on the first day of our rifle season. Ah. So, you know, it, it kind of put her at ease knowing that she didn't just shoot him and he was laying out there and the crows are eating him. And the coyotes well, that's a problem. Yeah, that's a prime example. That just adds to the story. Yeah. You know, we're out, we're out there making memories and, and building up the pride factor, but all those little pieces of the puzzle make it so much more enjoyable of a story. Mm -hmm. I mean, she'll always remember that. You know, that'll be a that'll be a, a great memory from now on for her. And she'll remember it too because I yelled at her. I was <laughs> I was I was recording it and I'm watching this buck come down. He's coming, he's coming. He had one more big oak tree to get around. She pulled the trigger, and I looked over at her. I said, you could not let him step out from behind there. I said, all I got was his butt flopping to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, you know, it was fun. We got the memory, you know. That's, that's right. That's what it's all about. That's right. That's exactly <clears throat> right. So. Well, I know my boys are excited about spring turkey season now because I got a couple gobblers on my cell cam. Yeah. So yeah. I showed them, like, I ain't couple more weeks, unfortunately. Well, for them, yeah, two more weeks. <coughs> you yeah, guys are at it already down there, huh? Oh, we've been at it for a week and a half now. I, I don't want to hear yeah. about that. <laughs> yeah. And I've got, man, I, I'm loaded with gobblers this year. I mean, just 
I can go on the back porch, drink my cup of coffee in the morning, and they're just screaming. I, I live on like 90 acres right here, and it butts up to a a, a 2100 acre piece. I, I bought my little place and have added to it over the years, but I've got 90 acres here, and then right behind me is 2100 acres that only two guys hunt, and it's just, man, I, they're gobbling like crazy, man. Really, I mean, Waddell's dying to come up here hunting. I'm like, no, sorry, Waddell. <laughs> <laughs> I I haven't been out this year, you know, just because of things I've been dealing with, but um I've got till uh May 15th, so we'll we're going to try to get out there here soon. Hopefully I my I get my prosthetic leg here in about a week and a half. I see your season ends a week or so after ours starts up here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I don't understand why we're so late. I just, yeah, I I I don't understand that either. I I it's got to be something weather-wise. It's got to be that way. Huh. It could have been the fact that uh, two days ago it was 30-some and snowing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was cold. Hit down here, actually, Friday and Saturday. It was it was pretty darn cold, windy. I guess it's the same front that slid all across the country, but, yeah. And then and then uh, it was 76 degrees on Sunday. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, 70-some degrees today. Exactly. So... Well, buddy, I think that's about it for this episode. Yeah. Well, hey, I'm sorry for the interruptions. Oh, no, man. We we appreciate it a lot, you taking your time out of your day to hang out with us and talk to just a couple of nobodies in this business. And, uh, no, we're, no, we're all, we're, all, we're all rednecks that like to <laughs> fly the outdoor flag. So, no, I, I enjoy it, man. I appreciate you guys reaching out to me. And, um, you know, if you'd like Michael or Nick, I can give you their email and, uh, I'm, I know they'd be proud to do it. Just have to sit down and have a time, but they, they, we don't, we don't really turn down any radio interviews or podcasts and stuff like that. So yeah, well, after we get done with this, we'll get that info off you and we'll, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll shoot an email back to you. I appreciate that a lot. Uh, absolutely. So where can our, uh, listeners find you on your social medias? Yeah, Instagram, Facebook, and uh, Twitter. You can go to T-Bone Outdoors. And then um, also we post stuff for all of us on bonecollector.com. And, um, you know, we got our website there and with merchandise and such. And you can find out, you know, where we're going to be appearance-wise as well as, uh, uh, you know, like showtimes and stuff like that. So we appreciate everybody. It looks like we're kind of getting a little bit back to normal. I don't think we'll get back to normal until we – get a new president but nonetheless ain't that the truth <laughs> yeah before you know it we're going to be doing zoom meetings with masks on huh? hey, hey, it's gonna, you know what maybe you ought to run for president no i'm <laughs> no I, I don't want that job I, I sure don't i keep saying if i had enough money i'd do it all you need is a harley and a four-wheel drive sitting in front of the white house and you know america's Gosh. gonna be good you exactly <laughs> exactly a couple shotguns yeah. hanging in the oval office I just don't know how we got to this. I, I don't. I, I just scratch my head. I don't want to go political. I know we're fixing nah. to pick it up, but you know we all could go that way. But um, hey, we've we've got our health. We are waking up every day. We're hunters. We're fishermen, and uh, we got get to enjoy God's great outdoors and fling a few arrows too. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, like I said, I appreciate you taking your time out of your day, buddy, and. Uh... We will talk to you soon. I'm going to read off our sponsors. I mean, if you want to stick around for that or take off. No, that sounds good. I appreciate you guys having me. All right, buddy. Good. Matt, you ready? I sure am. (laughs) Crick Archery. Find your passion and hunt it down. Got Duke Traps. Duke Traps. You're the trapping guy here. You can do it. I'll let you do this one this oh, time. I get to do Duke Traps. Okay. Yeah, well, don't I mean, screw it up because Bill's listening. <laughs> family owned and operated. <laughs> American made products. Get Mississippi. To, yep. Right you actually call. Remember them things. Telephones. You used to have them on the wall with the cords and everything. Mm-hmm. You can actually pick it up, dial them, and uh, talk to him on the phone and place your order. Yeah, you can talk to Mr. Bill. You can look him up at www.duketraps.com. And it's getting that time of year for our buddy, Steve Fetchko. Yep, Fetchko Heating and Cooling, family-owned, operated for 20 years or so now. Uh, they're going to get you ready for what's hopefully going to be a hot summer. Get some riding in. 
Yeah, it'd be nice to get the Harleys out here soon. Yep, they're an authorized Armstrong dealer. Give them a call. Check them out on Facebook, Fetsco Heating and Cooling. And we got my buddy we got to spend the whole weekend with him, Dear P. Dave. Dear Lord Dave. (laughs) Apparition Sense, 100% lethal. Look them up, www.apparitionscent.com. They're on Facebook, Instagram. Dave even got a TikTok. He ain't doing those silly dances yet. I'm trying to get him to, but he won't. So, give those guys a holler. We got uh, your third job. You got a lot of jobs. Yeah, my third job. Out there at Dominic's Butchery. Yep. Custom cuts. We Any critter, you bring it out there, we'll chunk them up so you can put them in your freezer. Stop out there and see us this fall whenever we're cutting up deer. And we got Hillview Motors, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram. By the end of this season, I will mess up that lineup of cars, <laughs> trucks, everything else. But stop out and see our friend uh, Steve Huba, sales Steve department, Huba. Butch out in the Collision Center, and uh, go give him a give him a chance. Good people up there as well. Yep, real good guys. And then the event that we spent the weekend out is our last sponsor, partner for this episode is Chico Outdoors. They just had their annual outdoor expo at the Westmoreland Fairgrounds and uh, had a great turnout for that. If you don't know, check them out on Facebook, Chico Outdoors. It's a nonprofit organization promoting recreational activities such as hunting, fishing for youth and our military veterans. It was started from Matt's uh, brother tragically passing away and keeping his honor going. Mm-hmm. So check that out. It's a great group of guys and give them a shout. Look them up on Facebook. Well, that's it, buddy. Well, that's going to wrap it up. I think we're going to put this one in the books. Check us out on Facebook, Instagram. Rob still got the TikTok rolling, the Keystone Experience. Go to our website, keystoneexperience.com. Got shirts, hats, stickers are back in stock. And uh, I think we're going to put a, put a bow tie on this one, buddy. Yep. All yep. right. Follow us along. Check us out, and we appreciate it. And we'll catch you on the next one.